Here's the whiskey kisses, peachy taste of sin. Greetings, whiskey folk. Welcome back once again to the official Drama Association YouTube channel. My name is Adam Bradshaw, and it is an absolute honor to welcome you to the Strat Studio for another Drinking Out Loud episode. And this one is the very first indie showcase here on Drinking Out Loud. Now, the indie showcase is uh, it's it's a member favorite uh, tasting. It's it's something we do every three or four months usually and in, uh, in the before times here at the Drum Association where we get together as a club and we usually have between six and eight um, independently bottled whiskies uh, showcasing some of the best new releases that we've had at the Strath. Uh, it's usually uh, it's usually the place where you get some pretty pretty damn good bargains. It's also uh, very often the place where we showcase some brand new releases that haven't even made it to the shelves yet and we we actually often sell out of uh, quite a lot of the whiskies that we present at these tastings at the tasting. So if you weren't at the tasting, you just never had a chance to buy the whiskey, which is sad. It's, it's very sad. Thankfully, with it uh, being digital right now, we can actually fit a lot more people in the room than uh, we normally can. So um, hopefully all of you watching at home right now are uh, ready uh, for a couple of bargains because this is, this, is, this is good. This is a cool indie showcase, and it's an indie showcase like no other, because this is an indie showcase where we are looking specifically at independently bottled grain whiskies. Now, grain whiskey is something which I feel, actually, I, I used to feel like it was, um, you know, a little bit of a, a hidden secret. It's uh, Scotland's other whiskey, and it's it's often looked down on by by some old school whiskey people and that's kind of unfair and to be honest though i think people are wisening up i don't think it's a secret anymore i think <laughs> i think people in the know know that uh, grain whiskey can be really really good and i mean really good um some of the best whiskies i've had in my life are not single malts but single grains and we're actually going to start off with an opening dram today uh this is something we've had a couple of times in the dram association before um it's, uh, it's an old favorite of mine as well. And this is one of the whiskies that you can definitely um, thank for putting grain whiskey back on the map. However, this isn't a single grain. This is a blended grain, the original blended grain, as far as we can tell. Starting off today, of course, with compass box hedonism. All right. Oh, beautiful. What can I tell you about compass box hedonism? Well, I can tell you a few things, but let's see what the box can tell you first. Apparently it's rich vanilla and alluring, so that's that's always nice to hear. Uh, natural color, non-chill filtered, made by John Glazer of uh, Compass Box fame. He's the founder and uh, the, the, the master distiller. Uh, distiller. Wrong word, Adam. Master blender of Compass Box. Compass Box don't distill their own whiskey. They're a blending house, so it's, uh, it's very different. Um, what does it say? Hedonism. There is a purity, a seductiveness, and a certain enticing femininity to Scottish grain whiskies, which can make them special among spirits. At their best, aged in good quality American oak casks, brimming with vanilla and echoing rich pastry cream on the finish, they are amongst the most delicious whiskies in the world. At their best, grain whiskies are the perfect style of whiskey to name hedonism. The inspiration behind our whiskey, hedonism, is just that pleasure, enjoyment, a celebration of that ideal marriage between distilled spirit and high quality oak maturation. The aromas and flavors into vanilla, caramel, delicate fruitness accented by flashes of coconut in the finish. This is a whiskey that will appeal to both the ardent whiskey enthusiast and newcomers to whiskey alike. Serve any way you like, any time you like, and above all, share and enjoy. Yeah. 100% first fill American oak casks. Cool. Actually, in recommendations further down on the box, it does say uh, recommended as a uh, aperitif. Uh, served with a small amount of chilled water. Late in the evening, serve neat. Also makes a great whiskey sour. <laughs> I like that. If it's uh, if it's early evening, have a bit of water. If it's late evening, don't worry about the water. <laughs> Good words. Yeah. Um, and actually, on on my little note earlier about uh, my my little screw up saying that Compass Box uh, John Glazer is the master distiller, which he absolutely isn't. He actually doesn't even say uh, call himself a master blend. He calls himself master whiskey maker, um, 
or, or just whiskey maker, which I think is a very good term. It actually explains on the box what they mean by that. We are Scotch whiskey makers. This word, whiskey maker, is our word. It doesn't, appear, it doesn't appear in a dictionary. To us, it combines product and process, making them one, defining our approach. Each whiskey begins with an idea, a vision formed through a combination of traditional practice and our own inspiration. Different than a distiller, more than just a blender. We are Scotch whiskey makers. So yes, my apologies, John, you are a whiskey maker. You're not a blender and you're absolutely not a distiller, um, but you are a genius by all rights. So for those of you who might not be familiar with Compass Box, they are kind of the foremost um, blending house in terms of um, reputation, I guess, these days, in terms of uh, the, their quality. They are one of the best and most well-known of the modern um, modern blenders. So we're not talking, you know, your doers and your Johnny Walkers and, you know, your, your giant blending houses that have been around for centuries. Um, this is a new type of blending, uh, not blending for mass production and consistency, but blending because people realize now that there is another side to blending. There is a side where you can legitimately blend two things together and make them more than the sum of their parts. And that is what Compass Box is all about. They started in the year 2000, and this was actually their first whiskey, the original Hedonism. Uh, they've gone through a few iterations since then. Every batch is, you know, slightly different. Like I said, they're not going necessarily for consistency. They're going for greatness. Um, so, yeah, actually on that, this batch, it actually has sticker on the back of every hedonism will tell you what batch it is um, and this is an interesting one this is batch mmxvii dash b so uh think, thinking about the roman rules there that would be 2017 b um i don't know if that means uh it was bot actually it has a bottling date right underneath this was bottled on the 16th of october 2017 so it's actually you know taken a while to get to our shelves uh, this is bottled almost three years ago um and the interesting thing of course with compass boxes they are not shy about sharing their recipe. They are big believers in telling you exactly, exactly what is in their blends so that theoretically you could make it at home if you want. And that's the trick. You see, most blending companies, you know, have it as a huge secret what goes into their exact recipe. You know, you're never going to find out the exact recipe of Johnny Walker Green Label because it's a massive industry secret. It's, you know, it's, it's like the, uh, the, the herb and spice mix at KFC, right? It's kept under lock and key. However, with Compass Box's approach, they realize that, like I said, these are all limited edition one-shot blends. Even their standard uh, whiskeys that you can always get, like the Hedonism, differ quite a lot. And the different batches are, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, still a limited edition. Um, so they're not worried about keeping... A, a, a secret recipe because you know their, their own recipe is going to change quite dramatically quite dramatically between batches and in fact they, they do um it's uh so it's it's not a secret um and you know the 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 main reason that people keep these kind of recipes a secret is so that people don't make their own and i was really joking when i said you can make your own at home because unless you're some kind of crazy millionaire whiskey fanatic with access to all kinds of things that most people don't have access to. You can't make this at home. The ingredients aren't available to purchase by you or, you or I. You know, you can only buy them in bulk direct from uh, whiskey brokers or direct from the manufacturers. So we're not going to be able to do this because the ingredients to this are Port Dundas, which is a closed distillery. Uh, reportedly in this batch, this is this is kind of cheeky. They're not allowed to say the age of the components. That's the one thing that they're technically not allowed to do unless you specifically ask them. But they, they seem to have found a way to have snuck in this information to the publicly available um, uh, PDFs that you can find. They've got this new, it looks like a spider's web thing, uh, where if you actually look at it, it's rings on a tree. And each component, which is on a pie chart, uh, each component actually uh, corresponds to a different ring on the tree. So they're actually telling you the age and secretly, which is kind of cool. So I can tell you that 12% of this is Port Dundas. And that Port Dundas, which is, again, a closed distillery, is actually 21 years old, which is cool. Um, then 37% of this is uh, one of my favorite grains, North British. Uh, mostly one of my favorites because I used to be able to see it from my bedroom window. Um, and that is uh, apparently 23 years old, so even, even older. Um, both again, first fill, uh, first fill like bourbon casks. And then finally, the, the major, comp major component of this is from what is really the, the most prominent, um, 
the the most prominent uh, grain distillery in Scotland, Cameron Brig, um, or Cameron Bridge. I think it's actually pronounced Cameron Brig, although it, it looks like it says Bridge. It's, it's a Scottish thing. Um, this is 51% Cameron Brig, um, and this uh, 15 years old. So by all rights, even though, you know, almost half of it is between 21 and 23 years old, if they were allowed to put, if they wanted to put a, uh, an age statement on this bottle, they'd have to call it 15, because that's the lowest component. And there's nothing wrong with 15-year-old whiskey, as you know, especially at the price that they ask for for hedonism, because this is really inexpensive. It's normally on our shelves for $133.83, and you can get it right now, actually, for $118.17, which is good. It's really, really good for high-quality blended grain whiskey. And like I said, this is actually... To the best of our knowledge, the first ever commercially available blended grain whiskey. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll break that down for you a little bit in a second. Uh, but another first ever that this is, which a lot of people are even more shocked at, because it, it's shocking enough that it's a brand new style of whiskey that had never been released before in Scotland until the year 2000. It's even more shocking that, as far as we can tell, this was the very, very first Scotch whiskey to have a woman on the label. And it came out in the year 2000. That is kind of weird and uh it's it's actually really really weird and uh power to compass box they're not just you know they 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 made a, a bit of a big deal about that and you know they've uh, they've they've done uh, uh subsequent uh hedonism bottlings uh, and they're always very prominently featuring uh, women on the label but they're actually a very equal opportunity um uh, a company as well uh like their their new um, sort of secondary whiskey maker, I guess, from John Glazer. Um, Jill Boyd is is absolutely incredible, and I believe they actually now have more women in their company than men, which you know is 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 very good to see, especially as biologically women are probably better whiskey makers because <laughs> uh, they have um, better palates, and that is actually a biological fact, apparently. Um, which theoretically stems from the whole hunter-gatherer thing, because uh, while while the men were out uh, slaying beasts and whatnot, uh, the women were picking herbs and things. And it's very important to have a good palate when you're trying to figure out what is poisonous and what is not poisonous, <laughs> which makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you, evolution. So yeah, I've been talking for far too long. Uh, apparently, twelve minutes already. Uh, so I'm gonna crack open this bottle. Because it's uh, this is only supposed to be the warm-up round, a very good warm-up round, but a warm-up round nonetheless. So it's time to stretch, if I can get the lid off. Wow, that is a tight-fitting lid. I might need pliers. All right, I'm gonna have to use my shirt, loosen it. There we go. Lovely. Beautiful pot, beautiful glug. I'm not going too hard. Beautiful. Yeah, hedonism. All favorite of mine. And it, like the bottle, or the box says rather, this is one of those whiskies which is perfect for um, seasoned whiskey drinkers and newbies alike. It's perfect for seasoned whiskey drinkers because although it is very, very approachable, it's so complex and delicate that there's a lot to look for if you actually want to sit there and sort of study it with your uh, with your palate or your nose um, but it's perfect for for new whiskey drinkers because it's not challenging it's not overly sweet it's not overly um, you know it's not overly sherry flavored it's not overly peaty it's not peaty at all um, there's there's yeah th there's going to be very few people who dislike this whiskey. It might not be that many people's absolute favorite whiskey of all time, but as an all-rounder, as, as something that you can, if you're ever wanting to buy a gift for a whiskey person and you have no idea the kind of whiskeys that they like, if you want to make sure to get them a really safe gift, something like Hedonism is absolutely perfect. Because like I said, I can't think of a single person who's going to dislike this whiskey. It's so beautifully well crafted and so it's just likable flavors right it's butterscotch 
Uh, it's vanilla. It's creamy. It's, like it says, coconut on the finish uh, is, is one of the things that I'm usually looking for in this one as well. Um, I have to admit, though, I'm not entirely certain if I've had this batch before. In fact, I'm fairly certain the last batch I had had the old label, so I, actually I don't think I have had this batch before. But it is good. Oh, what's the ABV on this one? 43? 43. Which kind of leads into the whole approachable thing, right? Mm. It's hard to think. It's hard to imagine, to be honest, people trying this whiskey blind and not saying, that's a really good, well-crafted whiskey. Um, but there's a lot of people who won't buy this whiskey, won't even touch it because of the G word. Because it's actually, because of the B and the G word, it's it's a blend and it's a grain, two things which are often very, very misunderstood and often mistreated in the Scotch whiskey world. So, as I mentioned before, grain whiskey, and let, let's, let's break whiskey down to its components to explain what grain and, and malt really mean. So, Scotch whiskey has two actual sort of building blocks, if you will. There's two basic styles of, of whiskey uh, from, from which the other ones stem. We have malt whiskey, which is kind of the, the more traditional. It's, it's made, um, it has to be made uh, with 100% malted barley in a copper pot still. That's pretty much the definition of malt whiskey. It has to be aged in oak for at least three years as well, but that's true for all whiskey um, in Scotland. Grain whiskey, it's, uh, again, it's a whiskey, so it has to be aged in oak for at least three years is different both in ingredients and technique. Um, it can use any kind of grain that it likes, really, and it is distilled not in a copper pot still, but in a column still, which is, uh, is, is quite an interesting difference. Actually, maybe we should talk about column stills a little bit. We haven't really gone into, uh, in, into stills much in these uh, Drinking Out Loud episodes, but let's talk stills. So the copper pot still that you're all quite familiar with, it's, you know, the almost onion, uh, garlic bulb kind of shape um, sort of still. It's the one that's in the, dra the Dram Association logo in that in the A. It, it's, it's, it's the thing that most people think of when they think of a whiskey still, right? Um, that's old, very, very old, very, very traditional. But it's not necessarily the best in many, many ways. <laughs> so in the early 1800s, a gentleman called Robert Stein invented what was called the continuous column still. And the idea there was to create a still that lead needed less maintenance, that needed less fuel, that needed um, pretty much less money to run. And that actually then had a bigger output because you didn't need to you know, with the, the whole point of a pot still is you put ingredients in, you let it do its thing, you take the ingredients out, and then you wash it, and then you clean it, and then you put more ingredients in, you take it out. Continuous stills, the idea is you're just permanently pumping in and pumping out, and, you know, that's a lot more efficient. Um, and, yeah, he, he was working with a, uh, a distillery in the lowlands, I think it was called Kilbaggy, Kilbaggy, Kilbaggy? I was going to mix it with Kilbaggan in Ireland. It's not Kilbegan, it's Kilbaggy, I think, uh, which is, you know, long since closed. Um, and it was actually a, uh, a, an old distillery uh, before even the, the uh, introduction of the column still. Uh, in fact, I think before the column still, Robert Burns was uh, mentioned it, uh, in some of his writings. Um, he said something, what was the quote? I think I've got it. Um, Only fitted for the most vulgar and fire-loving palates. Uh, so probably not great, um, but yeah, he uh, he brought in the the column still to kill Baggy, and uh, you know it kind of it took off a little, but not actually that much because it wasn't that good. Um, the spirit it created wasn't particularly good, and it wasn't that much more efficient and that much more cost effective than the traditional methods. And everyone already had a still, so why would they? scrap their existing equipment for something that's only a little bit better. That's fair. So then someone else came along who is a name that you've probably heard um, much more so than uh, Robert Stein, and that is Aeneas Coffey. And Aeneas Coffey uh, was an Irishman 
and he perfected the column still. And it's an interesting guy, actually. Uh, we don't, there's not that much writing on his early life. We, we don't even know exactly where he's from, but we do know that he graduated from Trinity College. And after graduating, he worked for quite a long time um, in um, uh, Customs and Excise. And that is how he got weirdly into whiskey, because he would be visiting that's nice, uh, a lot of distilleries. It's opened up into a almost custody note now. So yeah, he'd be visiting a lot of distilleries because you know, customs and excise and whiskey go hand in hand, and uh, especially especially back in the day in Ireland. And uh, yeah, so he eventually got more into the um, the the other side, the manufacturing side of whiskey, and uh, he invented um, what is now known as the coffee still or the the patent still, which is like the perfected version of the uh, of the the column still. And it didn't really take off in Ireland. They they kind of eschewed it. They said, it, this, this is not good whiskey. This is not traditional whiskey. And Ireland at the time was the biggest manufacturer in the world. And, you know, Dublin was the the place for whiskey. Um, a fun fact, that's, that, that's one of the reasons, the main reason why uh, whiskey spelt with an E in America. Because at the time of America's foundation, when they started making American English dictionaries, it was Irish whiskey that was really, really popular at the time, not Scotch. Uh, Scottish was thought of as the secondary kind of rubbish whiskey. Irish was number one, which one would argue today is kind of the inverse. I mean, nothing against Irish whiskey, but Scotch whiskey is certainly more culturally prominent, I would say, these days. Um, but yeah, he, he perfected this uh, this column still, and his pretty much almost exact design is used in pretty much every country in the world today, not just to make uh, whiskey, but also to make other spirits, especially gin, very much used for gin. And... It was perfected so much, and it was so much better in many ways to a pot still, um, that it just, it, it made whiskey able to be consumed by the mass market, uh, because they started blending. And, and that is the primary function of grain whiskey. That is why it's, uh, it kind of was created in the first place in Scotland, and why Scotland it took off. They made huge amounts of grain whiskey and then blended it with malt whiskey to make Scotch whiskey. And, and that is Scotch blended whiskey is grain and malt together. That is what blended whiskey means in Scotland. Um, so then it took off and Scotch whiskey was available all over the world because of that introduction of grain whiskey, making it cheaper to produce and more um, mass producible as well. I mean, say mass producible. This is, this is the thing that took whiskey from being a small little sort of farmstead cottage industry to being a full-on industrial powerhouse um and actually i've got some stats here from uh, from from one year in the same year at uh, two of the the biggest distilleries um they the the pot still at mccallan uh, produced around five thousand gallons a year one pot still at mccallan and one column still at cameron bridge which is uh cheaper to make cheaper to run um you know all around just cheaper, um, made 150,000 gallons in that same year. That's 30 times, I think, quick math, 30 times the uh, the amount of, of whiskey from the same setup, the same still size. That's ridiculous. Um, so it really did make whiskey so much bigger. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the the start of grain whiskey. And then of course, from that, we also get uh, blended grain. So this is grain whiskey from more than one distillery. That's what blended grain means. Much the same as blended malt, or which usually called vatted malt, um, means um, it's a blend, but it doesn't contain any grain. This is a blend that doesn't contain any malt. Uh, so a vatted malt is just a blend of different malts from different distilleries, and a, a blended grain is a blend of grains from different distilleries. And it's weird to think that they hadn't really done that until now. I mean, there's definitely blended whiskies that, uh, that have grains from different distilleries as well as malts from different distilleries. You'd have, you know, a little bit of Cameron Brig and a little bit of uh, North British together with malts in, in several different blends. Um, but doing it without the malt apparently had never been done before the year 2000. All right, so let's get on with the Indie Showcase releases. We have five new whiskies which have never been on the shelves before at the Strath that we're about to release right now. And uh, I'm really, really looking forward to this. Normally with Indie Showcases, we are 
much more talking about the independent bottler and less about the distilleries. And we're flipping that this time because actually all five of these next whiskies are all from the same independent bottler, um, Duncan Taylor. And that's a bottler that we're relatively familiar with here. I'm not really going to talk about Duncan Taylor at all. Um, we're going to talk about the distilleries this time because none of these have normal or regular official bottlings. You can only really get them via independent bottling. So there are a lot of distilleries that people don't know anything about. Um, so I'm going to rip away some of the mystery and uh, explain a little bit about uh, about what makes each one of these distilleries unique and interesting, different. So yeah, thank you Hedonism, you are a fantastic warm-up. I'm going to pop you down here and we're going to start off with as I mentioned uh, before, because it's a component of hedonism, one of probably my, actually probably my favorite uh, grain distillery, um, not necessarily through flavor, but through the fact that I could see it from my bedroom window when I was at university. This is North British. Here it is. All right, take the bottle out and then I'll read the stats for you. Ooh, that is a hell of a color. My God, good Lord. All right, North British. So this is, for those of you who really want to get into the details, this is cask number 59130039. It was distilled in August of 1991. This is bottled in the, the year 2017. Funnily enough, in July, so if they'd kept it in an extra month, it would have had an, an extra year of age statement. But this is 25 years, and I guess 25 years and 11 months, basically 26. Um, weirdly, it is one of only 60 bottles that they got from this cask, which makes me believe that maybe they needed it for blending purposes and had some left over. Um, so it probably isn't the full cask, but they only released 60 bottles of this whiskey. Um, they're all individually numbered. This is bottle 30, which is kind of cute. Um, it is 52.7% cask strength. Non-chill filtered, of course, non-colored, of course, because we're talking high quality, independently bottled whiskey from Duncan Taylor here, and they do, don't do that kind of thing. Mm. Actually, for those of you who aren't familiar with Duncan Taylor, they've actually got a nice write-up on the back of the box, so I'll read that for you now, uh, just so you can get a little bit of an idea of who they are as a company as well. This is the bottler. Uh, Duncan Taylor, established in 1938, uh, Duncan Taylor Scotch Whiskey Limited is renowned for the quality and breadth of its single-grain Scotch whiskies. They don't just do single-grain, but this is what they're talking about right now, and they are actually quite well known for their high-quality grain releases. Casks of outstanding quality from Scotland's prime whiskey producing grain distilleries are hand selected by Duncan Taylor Scotch Whiskey Limited prior to bottling. The whiskies are matured at their original distilleries to allow them that to age in the environment in which they were distilled. So they don't deal with brokerage houses that mature in giant warehouses in, you know, the, you know, I don't know, rail yards of outer Glasgow or something. These are actually matured at the distilleries, which is cool. Um, the casks are only bottled when they reach optimum age and quality. Every whiskey bottled by Duncan Taylor Scotch Whiskey Limited is in its natural form without chill filtration, without addition of colouring. Completely natural. Duncan Taylor Scotch Whiskey Limited's unrivaled quality continues to be integral to the high reputation enjoyed by the company's award-winning brands. For more information on all products, please visit www.duncantaylor.com. I didn't really have much information at all, but, you know, at least I uh, gave, gave the official blurb out, made them sound good. <laughs> Um, my glass is empty. We should change that. Cool. So, pick away at the foil here. I've got it. Very nice. I don't know it's just completely labeled this on the back. It's very almost odd looking, to be honest. All right, 25-year-old grain whiskey from 1991. Mm, what do we have here? Hmm. That's interesting. The first thing I'm getting on the nose, and it's a very soft nose, the first thing I'm getting right now is um, um, the, what are they called? The uh, chestnuts. Um, it, there's a, 
the thing it's like a chestnut paste i can't remember the name of it i can't i can't even remember what cuisine it's from i, I feel like it's at eastern european maybe there's a, a chestnut paste it's almost like peanut butter but made of chestnuts it's uh, reminding me of that on the nose hmm that is very pleasant Yeah, it's, it's very nice. Soft, creamy, nutty nose. I'm interested to see uh, how this develops. I have to admit, you look at that colour. There's a hell of a red tinge to it. I would not be surprised if this was a sherry cask. And they don't actually say what kind of cask it is, I don't think. And actually, 30 of 60, Duncan Taylor. This is making me think there's a very high chance that this is actually an octave cask, because that is what Duncan Taylor is very, very well known for, is our octave series. Um, that's like taking a sherry button, making it into eight smaller casks, because that's about right. 60 bottles is about an octave. So there's a very good chance that it's actually an octave cask, and they're just not telling us, which is fair. You know, they don't have to if they don't want to. That's all there's quite a lot of information, the, the most important part, really. Hmm. Oh. That is almost definitely sherry. If that's not sherry, if that's not sherry, I will eat my cat. I don't know. That is gorgeous. Wow. This is the kind of cask that Compass Box would release a special edition over. Actually, it almost reminds me of uh, one of my favorite whiskies of the last couple of years, the uh, the Hedonism, uh, the Muse, um, which was a special edition Hedonism they did for an anniversary um, a couple of years ago now. That is, that is a very, very strong start to the tasting. I mean, I'm a little worried that we might have had the best whiskey first. We'll find out. It, it's all downhill from here or uphill. We'll find out. Oh, okay, so aside from being able to see it from my uh, university bedroom window, uh, what else can I tell you about North British? Well, um, I can show you this photo. <laughs> uh, founded in 1885 as an alternative source of grain whiskey to Cameron Brig, um, in an attempt to try and break the monopoly that DCL held on the whiskey industry. Uh, so yeah, they, they, they really wanted to have an alternative for, for blending houses that wasn't Cameron Brig, which was, you know, running away with the industry at the time. Weirdly enough, though, it is now co-owned by two rival companies, which is kind of heartening. I, I, I really like it when, you know, bitter rivals, in theory, um, get along really well. It's like those internet videos you see of a, of, a, of a dog and a cat getting on really well, which is relatively common, to be honest. If they grow up together, they're probably going to get on well. Um, but it's weird, because it's, it's co-owned right now between Edrington and Diageo. So Edrington, of course, McAllen Highland Park guys. Diageo, of course, the uh, monstrous, <laughs> monstrous company that owns half of Scotland, it feels like. They're the, you know, the, the Talisker, Lagavulin, um, Crag and Moore guys. They're everything, pretty much. Um, it's basically Famous Grouse and Johnny Walker co-own this distillery. And it's interesting, though, because I don't think... I don't know what Diageo used this um, grain for, because I do know that it's actually um, the most prominent... It prominently goes into Cuddy Sark, Famous Grouse, and Shivers Regal, none of which I, I think... I don't... pretty sure none of those are owned by uh, uh, by Diageo. Um, Cuddy Sark is now independently owned. Famous Grouse is... Um, is of course Edrington and Shivers is Shivers. Yeah, so I don't know why Diageo has a huge stake. I think there's a 50 50 ownership in this uh, funny little distillery in the heart of Edinburgh, in between. I can't remember if it's Gorky or Del Rye, but yeah, it's uh, a really nice uh, area. It's right next to Murrayfield Stadium, uh, the big, uh, big rugby stadium there. Um, but yeah, really cool distillery. And I'm going to put a little water in this to see what happens. I'm yeah, I'm really enjoying this so far. It's very, very easy to love this one. Which is kind of Grain's go-to thing, right? Like, it's it's not ever going to be smoky, pretty much. And it's generally never going to be, you know, a big, meaty, oily, almost sulfury kind of thing, which is the other um, thing that sometimes puts people off of whiskey. It's just kind of an all-round good whiskey. 
Like I said, if you like whiskey, you probably like grain whiskey. And that doesn't just go for hedonism, but single grains too. So yeah, single grain meaning grain whiskey from one distillery. That's all this is. And this is a single cask grain whiskey too. And that, that is sherry licious. Mm. And I can actually, it all, it feels very similar to in mouthfeel and in kind of the, uh, the aftertaste to the Kudisark Prohibition. So if you're fans of Kudisark Prohibition's sort of style of um, grainy, um, grainy sherry whiskey at uh, a high proof, this is probably, probably going to appeal to you as well. 52.7% ABV. It's cool. So we mentioned with green whiskey that there's two things that make it different from a single malt. There's the kind of still that's used, uh, but there's also the ingredients. And those ingredients can from vary. Theoretically, it can be pretty much any grain. Um, it can be, you know, it could be oats if you wanted it to be. It could be quinoa if you really wanted. Um, but there are some grains that are used more than others. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's particularly, particularly interesting um, that this is actually corn-based. Um, this is, you know, kind of bourbon, <laughs> almost. Um, but in my opinion, so much better than bourbon. Um, I, I like the way Scots use corn so much more than the way Americans use corn for my personal palate. Um, but for those of you who are usually, you know, American whiskey heads, like bourbon heads, and you, uh, you, you, you want to try Scotch, which is, uh, one of the things that influenced bourbon, I guess. This is this is it. Uh, this is predominantly corn, but most grain whiskies will have a certain amount of malt. And in this case, um, this has a, a minimum of 15% malted barley as well. So mostly corn, minimum of 15% malted barley in each mash, and that's to, that's to start the fermentation. Hmm. I can also tell you the um, the the strength of their new make because it's a coffee still. It's magnificently high, and this is pretty much the same across all of these distilleries, bar bar one. Uh, Ninety-four point five percent ABV is what they distill their whiskey to, and then they water it down by f before they put it in the cask, which is a common practice in 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 single malts, but it's generally not so much to reduce the alcohol level much, but it's to make it more. Um, consistent so that everything gets cast at the same ABV so you can have a better idea of how it's maturing. Uh, so in this one, they actually fill the casks at 68.6% alcohol, which is quite high. Um, not as high as, as some distilleries will will cask, uh, cask at, but this one going down to 52.7 means that it's basically lost 16% alcohol over its 21 years, which is quite good. It's, it's a well-matured whiskey. 21 years? Sorry, 20. Did I say 21? I, said, I meant 25 if I said 21, and if I said 25, that's what I meant. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's gorgeous. So, this is officially available right now at strathlicker.com, and uh, you can get this regular price, which we've only got six bottles, so I don't know if it'll ever see the regular price, uh, but regularly it will be on the shelf for two thirty nine oh four. dollars Right now, it is an online exclusive and has exclusive Dram Association pricing for people watching this video for $211.22. That's significantly less than $10 a year, which is kind of the, the normal, that's a bargain, I must buy it thing for, for aged whiskey these days. It's very rare you see it these days, to be honest. If you see a whiskey for $10 a year you're, uh, for a single cask um, release, you're doing well. You're doing very, very well. So this is, without doubt, an absolute bargain. But I have to say, all of these whiskeys are um, in, I mean, I don't know, I haven't tasted them all yet, um, but so long as they're actually all good tasting whiskies on paper, they're all bargains, which is one of the best things about grain whiskey. Um, I said at the beginning of this video that it's Scotland's, it was Scotland's little secret, but it's getting more and more well known. It's only getting more and more well known by those who are seeking out information and knowing about it. For people who don't have, you know, who aren't whiskey nerds, basically. Um, they still don't understand what single grain is. They still think that malt is better than blend and malt is better than grain. And that's why it's priced this way. If this was a malt instead of a grain, it would be probably double, probably more. 
I mean, you can tell that this was a fantastic cask that this was matured in. It is just beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Big thumbs up on that. That. That's a win. Yes. Ah, have a little bit of water. That is a good whiskey. Ah. Although, I do find it quite ironic. As, as I said, this is now co-owned, um, which is cool, uh, by Edmonton and Diageo. The funny thing is, Diageo is the direct successor of DCL, which is the Distillers Company Limited, uh, which was the distillery that, uh, the, the owner of the, the distillery Cameron Brig, that this distillery was created to be a rival to. So it's kind of, it's kind of been owned by the dark side in a sense um they tried to take down cameron brig and in the end just got partially bought out by them which is a little 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 sad um but fantastic fantastic single grain so thank you north british this was a delight all right that's uh yeah no I'm, i'll not put you back in the box you can you can you can stay out for a while because i'll probably bring your bracket back out for a for a, a group shot at the end next is another grain distillery, uh, of course, because that's the theme. Uh, this one is Gervin, and uh, this one's very interesting because this goes exactly against everything else that we're doing here today. Grain whiskey, I, I've mentioned a few times uh, in the past, is absolutely fantastic when it's been aged for quite a while. And most people will agree that the vast majority of grain whiskies need to be aged, you know, at least 15 years before they get good. Um, and that's one of the downsides of grain over malt. This then should be interesting because this is Gervin, a very, very good distillery. And I've had some fantastic whiskies from Gervin. Um, interesting, Gervin actually uh, do make malt under the uh, Elsa Bay brand. Um, formerly, I think they used to own Lady Burn as well, but that stopped a couple of decades ago. But this is six. This is a six-year-old grain whiskey, which I find hilarious because it's still being branded under the rare old grain Scotch whiskey collection by Duncan Taylor. Six is not old. I don't know. I don't know if we need to like tell Duncan Taylor that because if they think six is old, that's slightly worrying. But I think they have a good idea that this is a cheeky alternative to old grain whiskey and if Duncan Taylor have bottled it then they obviously believe in it and I for one I'm very intrigued to see what this one is like very intrigued indeed all right so this is uh cask number 2114253 um one of 251 bottles individually numbered of course this is 197 it was distilled in April of 2011 and bottled in July of 2017. Six years old at 53.1% ABV from Gervin. Hey. Uh, Gervin. All right. So Gervin, interestingly enough, uh, was also built to uh, be an alternative to DCL's uh, ginormous... Ooh. That is a good pop. Ginormous uh, grain outputs at uh, Cameron Bridge. Um, and legend has it that uh, it was actually built because of an argument over advertising. Uh, so it was built by William Grant and Sons, who are you know, the, 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 the Balvenie, Glenfiddich guys. Um, and apparently they had a brand called Standfast and they made TV ads for it. And uh, DCL thought that was crass and... Uh, you know, poor taste. So they cut off their supply of grain whiskey so that they couldn't make their blend anymore. Um, in response to that, they went, screw it, we'll build our own. Uh, so they did in 1963. So, you know, almost 100 years after North British uh, stuck the middle finger up to Cameron Brig, these guys uh, followed suit. Cool. Um, yeah, and actually, they first ran the still on Christmas Day. Uh, which is a family tradition. That's also uh, true for Glenfiddich as, uh, as the reason. I think it was the, the, the grandson of the guy who first distilled the Glenfiddich was actually the guy who first distilled the Gervin on Christmas Day in 1963. <sighs> nice. It's a really soft nose. That's, that's very, 
very nice. Mm, getting getting baked goods. It's uh, pastries and muffins and like a a vanilla custard tart. And it's an interesting thing for uh, for Girvan as well. The main difference that they have between Girvan and North British, apart from you know location and history and everything, is a different ingredient. These guys aren't corn based. These are wheat based. Uh, so this is wheat with a minimum of eight point five percent malt. Hmm. Exactly the same strength for their uh, new make. Um, Ninety four point five is a very common thing with column stills to be that. Um, however, they actually have a range of filling strengths depending on its uh, intended use. Um, so they have either 69, 74, or 80% as their filling strengths. Not sure, not sure quite why that is, but uh, I, I assume they don't. I, I assume some are intended for longer maturation, so they put it in at a higher strength, maybe. Um, I assume some are maybe even going to be uh, used for gin, um, which would make sense. You can make a nice high high strength uh, thing for for gin uh, to fill it into a cask. I don't know why you fill it into a cask before making gin out of it. That's kind of silly. I regret thinking about that. But uh, maybe. I don't know. I have no idea why they have three different filling strengths, but they do. Hmm. Very nice. Oh, it's nowhere near as fiery as I expected. That is, that is the tamest Castron six-year-old I think I've ever had. It's fifty-three point one, which is actually pretty, pretty low. Um, very low actually for 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 a six-year-old. I don't know why this whiskey exists the way that it does, but I do know why Duncan Taylor bottled it because that's surprisingly good. Don't get me wrong, nowhere near as good as the 25-year-old North British. Just just isn't. But a lot better than it has any right to be. Hmm. Ah, Duncan Taylor dispelling myths once once again. Who says that young grain whiskey can't be good? This is weirdly good. Weirdly good. It's also incredibly good value. Ah. Uh... This, this one isn't quite to the uh, less than $10 a year thing, though, so don't get too too crazy. But it is normally only $74.70, currently $66 exactly. 66 bucks. I'm buying one. <laughs> this is only, like, 15 bucks or so more than Cody Sark Prohibition. My good lord. Yeah, I... I have to admit, I got this one in because I had a bit of a morbid intrigue, and I wasn't expecting it to be good. And a lot of a lot of my remarks and comments right now might be based on the fact that I was expecting it to be not very good, and it's actually pretty good. It might not be as good as I'm saying it is, because I might be artificially inflating it due to the fact that it's so much better than I thought, but it's pretty good. It, it's very... The $66 is... This might be the best value for money whiskey in the store right now, to be honest. Like, I can't think of anything that's $66 that is anywhere near as good as this. I have to say. Like, this puts it in the same kind of price range as... Oh, some some of the more budget single malts, or some of the higher-end grains. Um, oh, sorry, blends, I mean. Um, but it's kind of same price range as maybe... Highland Park Magnus, a little more than Magnus. Maybe uh, Beaumont 12... Um, the Ardmore Legacy, that kind of thing. This blows them out of the water, frankly. Mm. So yeah, unique little oddity that I was not expecting to be anywhere near as good as it is. Would I pay 200 bucks for this? Hell no. Would I pay 66? By the time this airs, I already have. <laughs> wow. Cool. Well done, Duncan Taylor. That was delightful. And shocking. Frankly, just shocking. <laughs> 
All right. Well, we're jumping back into the twenties this time. Um, we're 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 back into to old. In fact, the next three whiskies are consecutively one year older than each other. So we're going 27, 28, and 29 for the next three, which is going to be very interesting. And the next one, there's there's no doubt this one is a sherry cask. Um, it has a big sticker on it telling me so. And uh, for that reason as well, I'm very, very intrigued. And interesting thing, like sherry cask grain whiskey, why would you put grain in sherry? Uh, it feels like it's a, it's a modern thing to do now with this sudden resurgence of high quality interesting blends and uh and the resurgence of single grain whiskies but it's not that new because this was distilled in 1990 and has i believe had its whole life in sherry so they were doing it a long time ago um and you, you keep hearing stories of uh, sherry cast single grain popping up um I, I guess that some of the, the big, more secretive blends um, had a small component of sherry aged grain as part of their makeup. Um, but yeah, I mean, like the, that uh, Hedonism the Muse was actually a sherry cask, um, built around a sherry cask grain whiskey that they found in the warehouse. It was like 40 years old or something. So yeah, I mean, it's done, but it certainly makes little sense if you think about the history of it. But yes, this is Strathclyde, this one, Strathclyde. 27 years old, distilled in January of 1990 and then bottled in April of 2017. There she goes. Sherry cask, big sticker on it. Um, this is cask 6411539 um, and bottle 141 out of 158. So not many out of this one. Um, probably a hogshead uh, that was particularly leaky, I guess, um, or particularly Thirsty Angels in, in, in and around Strathclyde. I mean, Strathclyde's in Glasgow. I know, you know, the average person in Glasgow is uh, thirstier for alcohol than than, uh, than many other uh, locales. So maybe the Angels are, uh, are are of the same ilk. I just made out that Glaswegians are alcoholics. That's not quite what I meant to say. I just, but, you know, I feel like you do need to consume a certain amount of alcohol to, like, survive in Glasgow. Interesting. Very intrigued by this one. So yes, this is Strathclyde, and uh, I will put a picture of Strathclyde up right now. So yeah, Strathclyde um, is, like I said, Glasgow-based, and uh, it's actually the only grain distillery in Glasgow now after the, the famous uh, Port Dundas closed. Um, uh, it's actually built right by Glasgow Green, which is where James Watt invented the steam engine, which is kind of cool, seeing as steam is a main component of uh, how consoles work. They're steam heated, so kind of nice tie-in between uh, some uh, cool engineering history. Um, it was built in 1927 to make spirit, weirdly enough, not for whiskey, but for gin, um, which is odd because it was made for gin for in England. It was an, a London-based company that set up this distillery to make English gin. I don't know why they didn't just do it in England. Maybe there's some kind of tax benefit. Anyway, uh, before long, they started making whiskey as well because you're in Scotland, you may as well make whiskey. Um, and they had a brand called Long John, Long John Whiskey, um, which is long gone. Long John is long gone. These days, it is used mostly for the Ballantines blend, um, which is which is neat, a very, very popular um, blend. It consistently has, uh, the last few years, been scoring incredibly high in whiskey competitions, uh, especially the 17-year-old, um, which is very, very good, actually. Only a little bit more expensive than that six-year-old Gervin, and yeah, it might it might still be a contender for best <laughs> best value in the store. Ballantine 17, excellent whiskey, um, and this yeah is one of the components uh, for Ballantines usually. Um, again, a wheat based uh, a wheat based spirit, much like Gervin, and a slightly higher malt, minimum of nine percent, so tiny tiny amount higher. Same new make spirit, ninety four point five, but. Um, we don't know the filling strength. That's one thing that I couldn't find anywhere um, on in my research, either in books or on the internet. So uh, it's a mystery. Um, they're allowed to keep some secrets, I guess. Yeah. The Glaswegians can can have their secrets. But yeah, this one should be cool. If I can, if I can open it. Boil tabs. My, my nemesis. There we go. Very nice. Okay. Oh, that is a satisfying color in the glass. 
It looks good in the bottle, but in the glass. Mm. Put that lid back in. Ooh, that is deep. That is dark. That smells a little bit balsamic-y. Mmm, okay. That is not what I'm used to grain whiskey smelling like. This smells... Oh my. It does have a little bit of that herbal herbal note that, you, uh, that is, is often an indicator of grain whiskey. There's um, a lot of people in the SNWS tastings uh, will pick a grain by uh, having a dill note to it, apparently. Dill is a very prominent thing for grain over, over malt. Very rarely found in malt, but common in grain. Not sure dill is quite right, but it is a little herbal. Hmm. Wow, that is... Wow, much deeper, darker flavours. Slightly molasses, almost. Yeah, almost like a Pedro Jimenez kind of a nose. All right. Oh. Mmm, that is, that is sitting by an open fire on Christmas Eve. That is all kinds of stewed fruits. That is candle wax. That is foresty pine cones, you know, the kind of things that you make, uh, um, that, that kids make uh, centerpieces out. I don't know if that's a thing here, but in England at least, you make these uh, sort of candle pine cone centerpieces to go on the Christmas table. Oh, yeah. Wow. Very, very lightly minty. Mmm. Ooh. Singed. It's all of that singed. It's like um, pecan brittle. Uh, like making like candied pecans but heavy on the sugar so it's almost like a peanut brittle. Um, but you've, uh, you, you've you've set fire to the, the parchment a little bit in, in the oven so it's got that singed sort of smoked smoked pecan brittle. Mm. With like a stewed fruit compote. Oh, it's sooty. It's a little sooty. I don't know where that's coming from. That, for people that say that grains are one-dimensional and n n can't be complex, I, I give you this. I give you this absolutely mad 27-year-old Strathclyde, which is as complex of a Scotch whiskey as I've had in recent times. It's up there with, it's almost up there with the Glen Scotia Victoriana in its complexity, not quite in its wacky weirdness. Um, mm. Not that, I don't know, Victoria's not totally wacky weird. It's not like the, oh, what was that 3 a.m. dollar kebabs that we had in the outturn last week? No, um, it's, 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 not, it's not that, but it is, it's big. It's, it's, it's voluminous, it's, it's, mm. Mmm. Wow. If most green whiskies can be described of as like a variation of white bread, this is pumpernickel. Mmm. <laughs> oh. My. Cloves. Yeah, I'm getting cloves now. All right. This has been a hell of a journey. That's... Yeah. We're only halfway through, and I'm already at a loss as to which one my favorite is. It's like that North British is fantastic, but it's it's very, very much a grain whiskey with some sherry influence. This is just, this is just a magnificent puzzle. I like this a lot, and that Girvan is just sixty six dollars. <laughs> that's that's what it is. It's 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 sixty six dollars of greatness. This is uh, it's a little more than sixty six dollars. Um, this one is. Very, very good price still though. Normally two forty seven seventy four on sale right now at strathlicker.com for you guys. For Dram Association members um, and online sales, it's two hundred and eighteen dollars and seventeen cents. Again, coming in uh, quite
quite a bit under ten dollars a year. This is very good. When was the last time you had a twenty-seven year old sherry cask matured whiskey for that price? I can't. I I think the last time that is 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 a thing here was before my time. That is. Hmm. Just very, very good. That is, that's what that is. Hmm. All right. So we're halfway through the new releases. We're, uh, we're on to our, our fifth whiskey of the day. Hmm. After the opening gram. And it's time, it's a time, finally, to leave the lowlands. Shock horror. I know. We've all been bred to think. Well, not bred to think. This is not something that comes with, with, with nature. It's more of a nurture. We've all been trained to think um, that grain whiskey in Scotland is a lowland thing. That is not necessarily true. And it's actually probably not even the highland grain that you're thinking of. Uh, these days, especially in the Dram Association in the SNWS, we're probably used to seeing uh, the only highland grain that we're used to seeing, really, is Loch Lomond, which is... Yeah, it's a Highland grain, and they they do an all all sorts of different interesting things in their distillery with um, making making grain whiskey entirely out of of malted barley, um, which would yeah seems weird. But if you don't make malted one hundred percent malted barley in a pot still, can't be called a single malt. If you make one hundred percent malted barley in a grain still, it's grain whiskey. Sure, doesn't yeah, it's it's all just words. Um, but this is not Loch Lomond. This is Invergordon, and uh, Invergordon is cool. Invergordon's very cool. Uh, it is, when I say Highlands, I'm not talking, oh, it's Loch Lomond, just, you know, you could throw a stone to the to the lowlands from it. No, no, this is, this is high. This is northern Highlands. Uh, Invergordon's neighbours are, basically, it's, it's near Glenmorangie, it's near Kleinleash. Um, yeah, it's, it's up there. It's, it's right by Dalmore. It is north. <laughs> it's very north. And it's right on the coast. In fact, um, it used to be a naval base. The town of Invergordon was a naval base from World War I up until 1956. And this distillery, one of the main reasons it came to pass is that there was an awful lot of people who were without work after the naval base shut down. So they decided to build a distillery so that there was jobs to be had. Uh, distilleries at the time, I think, were being... Um, uh, had some uh, tax breaks on building new distilleries for some whatever reason. So it made sense at the time. And yeah... It's a grain whiskey, but on the coastal far north of Scotland, um, in the Highlands. It's it's one of those things that sounds like it shouldn't exist, but it does, and I'm glad it does, because Invergordon's pretty, pretty neat. A coastal Highland grain. And we're about to try not one, but actually two. We've got a 28-year-old and a 29-year-old, and from what I understand... The 28-year-old we definitely know is a sherry cask. The 29-year-old technically we don't know what cask it is, but because it's not specifically been designated a sherry cask, I assume it's probably a bourbon cask, but we're probably going to find out. So we'll be doing this a little bit of as a side-by-side, -side, but let's start off with the 28. 28 years of Highland grain. All right. Look at that beauty. It's like darker than this copper table. Um, okay, so this is cask D520002. It is bottle 28 of 201 bottles. It was distilled in January of 1990, bottled in August of 2018. So it's actually 28 and over 28 and a half. And its ABV is 42.7. So some thirsty, thirsty angels. And uh, this should make for a really unique low ABV cask strength whiskey. And I love it when that happens because with a low ABV cask strength whiskey, which you generally only get with super old whiskeys, um, you get the best of both worlds. You get full on water down flavor, all, all of that flavor um, in concentrated form without the burn. Like there's not, gonna, I'm expecting like very, very little burn to this. Like I don't like the S word, but I'm expecting this to be smooth as hell. Let's find out. Very 
Very nice. <laughs> Excellent. So excited. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that is very sherried. You know, this is very similar to that Strathclyde. I'm actually going to bring that back and do a side by side so I can note the differences. A little fruitier. So, whereas the Strathclyde is very much, you know, uh, mince pie fillings, you know, raisins and whatnot, this is a little bit more um, brandy soaked cherries, you know, a little bit juicier. A mm, little peppery on the nose as well, which I like. You can, it's not just the sherry, you can almost smell the, uh, the, the wood more in this one. It's a little bit more wood influence, a little bit more of that European oak kind of note. Mm. Mm. Oh. Oh my. This is, this is really good too. <laughs> ah, cool, cool. Mm. Yeah. It's got a little hint of more coffee, chocolate flavors now. It's, it's definitely a little deeper and darker than the Strathclyde. Two, and the more I the more I go for them, the more different they become, even though they felt quite similar at the beginning. Yeah, the Strathclyde is a little sweeter, a little bit more vanilla fudge. This one's a little bit more dark chocolate coffee bean. And cherries. Mmm, the cherries. Oh, it's just, just soaked in cognac. Mmm. Wow. 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 <laughs> okay, let's try a little bit of water in this. Oh. Hmm, it smells hotter with water. That's odd. Hmm. Yeah, that pepper note's coming through a lot more after a couple of drops. Yeah, it feels like it's woken up the more bitter, like a little bit of a, almost like a wood shavings kind of a thing going. It's a, a lace nearby. Hmm. Yeah, there's a polished oaken banister. Hmm. Oh, that is... That is too good. That is, that is too good. You know, I was very excited to bring these whiskies in. I knew they were going to be cool. And yeah, I've, I've actually had them in the cupboard for quite a while, waiting to release them for, for the right time. Now is the right time. And yeah, yeah, these, this, yeah. <laughs> it, it feels like it perfectly fits the season. It's, it's, it's summery going into fall, going into winter. It's, it's a very autumnal thing, most of these whiskies. Like, the grain, in, in essence, being that lighter, more delicate flavor, usually, um, usually lends itself to more of a summer whiskey. But these sherry cask ones, my, these are, these are something else. These are, yeah, something quite different. Oh, all right. Well, this Invergordon is very cool. Let's see how it stacks up to the one year older version. 
So this is Invergordon, 29 years old. Doesn't state Sherry Cask, but it might be. We can find out. Doesn't doesn't look like that. Oh, if you've ever been to a distillery or a whiskey museum or something with a difference of maturation, that is a perfect example. Hopefully you can see. Let me put something white behind it. How's that? There you go. Perfect. That is the difference between an almost the same age sherry cask and bourbon cask. See the yellowy hue of this one and a slightly lighter color? Doesn't mean that it's younger, it's actually older by a year. But that is what a bourbon cask American oak does, and that is what a sherry cask European oak does to the whiskey. Hmm. Look at it in all of that glory. All right. So we flip these back the right way around. So what can I tell you about this uh, 29 year old? I can tell you it was distilled before I was born. Um, was distilled in February of 1988, a month before I was born. It is cask 8,134, and it is bottle 176 out of 252. Um, it was bottled then in March of 2017. 29 years old. ABV, 52%, so a substantially higher ABV than its uh, younger counterpart there. Which is also interesting. Let's see. I'll eat that. I'm not yet. Let's see what happens here. Well, I should have mentioned as well, Invergordon. Ooh, got a bit of sticker on my phone. Um, Invergordon is uh, owned by and uh, is the main component of White Mackay blends these days. Um, it's. Uh, different to all of the other distilleries we've had today in that it doesn't have a singular grain type that it uh, mixes with malt. It's actually a blend of wheat and corn. So it's kind of both of them together. We've got wheat, corn, and presumably malt, although they don't tell us how much malt they put in. Uh, they do tell us the new make spirit strength of this is 94.4, slightly less, though not perceivably less really, um, than the, uh, the other ones today. And they have a particularly strong um, uh, casking strength of 71%. Perhaps being a different climate to the uh, the others, maybe a little breezier by the water, they find that their whiskey matures a little uh, a little faster and they need that extra ABV so that it's still above 40 when it gets older. That would certainly make sense with our 28-year-old there. All right, let's see what happens here. Yeah, that's an incredibly different whiskey. This is a really interesting side-by-side. -side. Same age-ish, same distillery. Different cast type. Oh, wow. Holy, holy crud, that's different. It's night and day. Summer, fall. Summer, fall. It's great. This is, hmm. This is apples and peaches and apricots and butterscotch and almost a little bit of chili pepper. Yeah, look, there's definitely a little bit of chili pepper um, lots of black pepper. Mm. Vanilla ice cream. Oh, yeah. That is such a difference. That is a magnificent pairing. Mmm. 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 Yeah. I bet if Compass Box bought these barrels, they would have, or casks rather, they would have blended them together and called it hedonism exuberance or something. Actually, do I have another glass? Call me a heathen. I'm going to create hedonism exuberance right now. Let's go for about 50-50. Hmm. Oh, yes! Hmm. You know? I'm not necessarily sold that it's 
better than the sum of its parts. I'm, I'm not a master whiskey maker. I'm not a John Glazer, and I did just choose two good whiskies and equally measure them. It's not science. It was just me playing around. But I have to admit, this is, in my mind, as good as the components and very different. It just, it really does bridge them together. Mm. Yeah. I recommend getting one of each of these, buying an empty bottle, and pouring about a third of each into the empty bottle so that you've got two thirds of each individual and them blended together. And you have yourself a fine set of whiskies. Mm. Late fall, early winter. Actually, who am I kidding? Christmas. Winter, spring, summer. No, summer. Winter, summer, fall. I wonder if you played around with the ratios, you'd make a spring whiskey. That's really cool. I'm, I'm very glad I did that. But back to the whiskies at hand. I can't pick a favorite between these because they're very, they're both excellent at what they do and they're doing very different things. I think it entirely depends on mood. I think right now, nine times out of 10, I'm heading in a more bourbon cask realm these days. I'm really enjoying the, the American oak vanilla sweetness uh, side of whiskeys. But when sherry is done really, really well, I, I am a big fan of sherry. And I know that I'm a bit of an outlier here in Victoria in terms of preferring bourbon casks in general these days, because sherry cask is definitely the more popular popular choice uh, in terms of sales and in terms of reviews uh, here in the Dram Association. So I think, uh, I think an awful lot of people are going to like this 28 more than 29. But I personally, today, prefer the 29. But I think it's going to be entirely based on mood and weather and a lot of other things that both excellent quite different whiskies in their own right should probably try a drop of water in this 29 seeing as it's quite quite uh, high abv hmm. interesting uh, a note that i haven't really found in anything yet today it's of uh, a lemony Kind of, kind of been missing a bit of citrus. To be honest, there's not been much going on in these whiskies, but it's delightfully lemon curdy on the nose now. Hmm, lemon curd and brioche. That's cool. That's nice. That way. I'm very bad with mirrors and things, but I think that's set up nicely now. Yeah, that. Is a nice little pair of whiskies there. Um, I should probably tell you the price. They are available right now at strathliquor.com. And uh, yeah, the 28 year old, the regular price is $259.91. And the sale price right now, um, if you get it within a few days of this video airing, unless it sells out, is $229.48. $229.48. Magnificent. The Inver Gordon 29, the bourbon cask one. Um, two hundred and sixty-eight dollars and sixty-one cents is its normal price. Um, so you know, about ten bucks more than the twenty-eight. That's pretty good. Um, and it is two hundred and thirty-six dollars and forty-three cents right now. Um, for um for the twenty-nine, which means that you could get the twenty-eight and the twenty-nine um before tax for around uh, around four hundred and seventy bucks. That's an upsettingly small amount for two incredible, incredible <laughs> old green whiskies. Um, yeah, I, I'm blown away by by this set. I, I was looking forward to it, and it did not disappoint in the least. Uh, thank you, Duncan Taylor, for creating these whiskies. Um, thank you to Fontana for bringing them into the province. I'm very grateful that you did, because we've had a, a, a pretty, pretty big lack of green whiskies recently. So it's uh, 
very very nice to see some high quality grain whiskies at a very approachable prices coming into uh, the province. So thank you very much. I guess I should line them all up and do a promo shot. Okay, so what do we have today? We had a compass box. We had the hedonism. That's a nice little opening. Then of course we went straight into a 25 year old from North British. Very nice. I'll move these across a little bit so I can see myself in the middle. Alright. So yeah. Compass Box Hedonism, uh, currently on sale for 118 and the North Bridge 25, currently on sale for 211 And then we had the <laughs> six-year-old Gervin. Um, the six-year-old grain whiskey, surprisingly, surprisingly good. Uh, that is 66 bucks, ladies and gentlemen. 66 bucks. Um, yeah. Very, very good value. Uh, then, of course, the 27-year-old Strathclyde, the deepest, darkest, most interestingly complex grain whiskey I've had in possibly ever. Um, yeah, that, that, that is an indie showcase like no other. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy with that. All of these are available right now until they sell out at strathalica.com. Um, I should mention of the new releases, um, we've got six of the North British. We've got, actually, sorry, I've already opened one. We've got five of the North British. Uh, we've got 11 of the Gervin. Possibly 10, because I'm probably going to pick one up. Because um, I can, and I can afford it. Um, the Strathclyde 27, we also have five of. The Invergordon 28 Sherry Cask, I, uh, I decided to get two cases of that. So we've got 11 of those, and we've got five of the Invergordon 29. So yeah. I hope you enjoyed this indie showcase. I can't wait to be able to uh, have one in person with you again at some point soon. Um, but for those of you who aren't able to uh, come visit in Victoria and uh, come to our indie showcases when they do get us, uh, up and running in person again, um, I am going to try and keep the YouTube videos going even after we start doing in-person tastings here at the Dram Association because, uh, frankly, I'm having fun and uh, I feel like um, there are some people who uh, would still enjoy that. So. Um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. I will see you at the next tasting, which whew, I'm hoping to take a few days off next week, but at some point very, very soon, we'll be doing our Japanese whiskey tasting with Pat Dunlop. Looking forward to getting Pat on video here. Um, it's, it's going to be interesting giving up my host spot and uh, letting him take the reins. Um, but yes, yeah, so you'll be seeing Pat here on Drinking Out Loud quite soon. And, uh, Yes, we've got an outturn coming up again because we always have an outturn coming up. We're going to have a Blackadder snake pit again coming up with our new partners at Co-op on the mainland. And yeah, this has been fantastic. I, uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, stay safe. I'll see you all next time. Slash of <laughs>